Форум Nobel Vision продолжает свою работу, и впереди еще масса интересных сессий. Nobel Vision continues, and, and a new session will start right away. The next session is called Hypochondria and Anxiety, Psychology of New Times. So with supported adventures, it touches upon a balance of high level anxiety or indifference. So can you provide help to people remotely? how not to be trapped mentally in this world. I would like to invite to the stage Alec Teplov, Director General of Web Ventures. A round of applause. Online speaker, Shinankar, Columbia University, Thinkers 50 rating, Thomas Zutkoff, Nobel Laureate, Prize winner in Psychology and Medicine. He'll join us in about 10 minutes. So over to you, colleagues. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm Oleg Teplov and uh, CEO of uh, Web Ventures. And today we'll talk about uh, hypochondria and anxiety, the actual questions of philosophy. And uh, actually, we all, together with us, witnessed the new most important historical event uh, for the last I would say, decade, the COVID-19, which was uh, firstly, I would say, for most of us, was treated like, okay, it's another few uh, flu, it's a swine or something like that, and we'll make some noise, make uh, some trends and etc., and then go off. But we, with this, uh, for almost two years entirely, and uh, it's not only changed our usual way of life, uh, first of all, with the lockdowns and etc., and uh, trying to get uh, some uh, food uh, with the uh, digital logistics and etc., and uh, working from home, not with your colleagues, but actually it's uh, changed the society itself. The society has changed globally, and uh, I think nothing will be returned to pre-pandemic uh, status. The COVID-19 is a global uh, event, and the impact which compared to the aftermath of technical revolution, uh, I would say, for example. Well, uh, I've been much already said today and during the, today's sessions about how the pandemic changed the way of work, the way of life, from uh, uh, changing and shifting uh, entire uh, spheres of economy to the usual uh, document processing of uh, our personal lives. Uh, getting the planes, uh, getting on board, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, well, the sphere of entertainment also changing from uh, real life to the virtual. Uh, we see more and more people in meta universes, uh, in uh, Facebook meta universe, in uh, some gaming, uh, epic meta universe, et cetera. But uh, all this stuff will was already launched, and uh, we, for like 10 years already, uh, with the developing on new digital technologies. But the question was uh, how fast they will uh, enter our lives. 10, 50, 100 years? And uh, actually, the heart of this uh, crisis is a rapid uh, implementation and rapid change uh, and digitalization of uh, all the processes. And actually, this thing is actually the hardest thing person can get. Working together with your colleagues in the office of 50, 50 people and they stuck at home and you don't know actually where you'll be working again in the office. Uh, for instance, uh, today I was speaking with my colleagues and uh, one of them was working in a large uh, Russian company. I said, okay, we closed for another half a year. And uh, the other guy uh, who's working in the uh, actually media uh, and uh, issuer of uh, some magazines said, okay, we are stuck in online office by the end of 2022. So people know that they will be sitting at home and working online for another year. And, uh, well, today we'll not talk deeply about uh, philosophy and uh, question about souls and uh, conclusions, but we're focusing on a specific topic. The focusing on discussion, how understand personal uh, health changes and threatening of the illness. The anxiety and the hypochondria, which we mentioned, 
really affects the work of uh, people's life, and these questions will be uh, issued today. The reverse of the COVID situation is inability to adapt to the changes. Uh, I was speaking to the workers who work on a factory, and they actually cannot see themselves not getting up early, 6 a.m., going to the factory, just clicking the, the bill and uh, working to the machines. No, it's really not in their mentality, and it really uh, affects their uh, life, and that, thus it affects the health issue, and etc. And together, together, today with our colleagues, we will talk about uh, uh, the fields of psychology and the medicine, and we will discuss some topics, uh, how to not to fall to the, this mental, uh, I would say, trap, and uh, what's the new time being, and how we can adapt to, to this and maintain the balance between online and offline and uh, balance between anxiety and uh, indifferences. And actually, I would like to present our speakers. Uh, Sheena Inger, the professor of business and management department of Columbia Business School, already joined us. Nice uh, seeing you and welcome to the Noble Vision Forum. And uh, Thomas Zutkov, we already said that he will be uh, joining us about 15 minutes or so. The Nobel Prize uh, winner of philosophy and medicine in 2013, uh, professor of molecular and cellular psychology, Stanford University. And thank you all the participants uh, on our discussions. And my first action, uh, actually question to you, Sheena. Uh, why do we choose to believe what we choose and believe based on our cognitive psychology and what expects can do inform people in their fears? And the second, uh, about the future. How problem solving or enabling a better future can we continue to exist with the COVID? Wow, okay, so those are some pretty big questions. Thank you so much for having me here today. Um, I think there's a lot of things that affect what we believe and what we don't believe, but I think what's really important to keep in mind is that even as we as human beings develop so many different advanced and complex technologies and we create worlds that are increasingly more complex and interdependent, one shouldn't lose sight of the fact that as everyday decision makers, when we try to size up what we should choose, we're looking for simplicity, not complexity. We really get overwhelmed when things become too complex. And so I know one of the big questions in people's minds right now is why aren't people getting vaccinated, right? It seems like to people in the medical community that this is a no brainer. And to many government officials, this also appears to be a no brainer. You have a vaccine, it's a way to protect you from getting this disease, why aren't people doing it? And certainly from the perspective of medical innovation, the development of the mRNA vaccine is absolutely monumental. I mean, this is a watershed event that they were able to create a vaccine in such a brief period of time. And so why aren't people doing it? And I think it's important to realize that people have um, different risk preferences based on how afraid they are. So I'm reminded of a different Nobel Prize winner, that of the work of Danny Kahneman and Amos Tversky, where they demonstrated something very simple and yet very applicable to the COVID crisis. So let's imagine that I give you a choice and I give you two choices. You could either lose $100 right now, no questions asked, or if I roll the die, heads, you give me $200, tails, you give me zero, right? Now, in both cases, I'm losing, but notice how in the first case, it's a sure loss. In the second case, Yes, there's a chance, there's a 50% chance I could lose a lot more, but there's also a 50% chance I could lose nothing. Now in this case of the choices between A and B, most people would choose B. So 
the phenomenon known as loss aversion, that we as people tend to hold on to what we have and would rather take a risk, a really potentially irrational risk at times, would rather take a big risk if it means that I could hold on to my status quo position. So now if you think about the vaccine and the current situation that people have right now, by choosing not to do the vaccine, it isn't exactly irrational from the perspective of loss aversion. You walk around in your daily life, you're healthy. You, if you take the vaccine, there's a chance that you'll continue to remain healthy. That's the only upside. It's not a massive upside. It's not like I'm, you're about to hand me a, bill, a billion dollars or something, right? If I do this thing, I maintain health. Okay. I might be willing to do that if you've made it really, really easy for me to do it. And it's clear that if I do X, I lose nothing. That there's no risk. Kind of like, you know, taking taking vitamins. If you stuck it in my mouth every day, I'd probably take it if you made it really easy because I don't have any fear associated by doing that thing. Or if I get sick and you tell me I should take Advil or Tylenol or something, sure, I know that that's easy fix. It gets rid of the headache. I'll be back to normal. But what's the problem with the vaccine? It doesn't become simple. If I take it, there's all this complexity and information as to, well, is it good for me, bad for me? What is it? Is am I going to be worse off if I take it? Maybe they don't know. What should I do? Add to that the fact that, well, even if I get it, most of the people around me, they don't seem to die. It's kind of like a cold. I could probably survive that, right? Right. So we do think that that's a big part of the decision making around um, whether or not people want to take the vaccine. I think in terms of future innovation, what do people care about? I thought it was very interesting how you mentioned the future of work. And I, I do think that um, Zoom has played an amazingly interesting role in our lives in that some of us love it because it means we can stay in bed longer. Some of us hate it because it means that um, I don't get to see as many people. That will probably end up balancing or equilibrating out. I think the really big thing that's happened as a result of Zoom is that despite the fact that wherever you go in the globe right now, there's an increasing emphasis on people becoming more local, more polarized. They want to be more part of their clique. Yes, that's a true phenomenon, and that's leading to lots of interesting political preferences. But I think the really big thing that's happening underneath our noses is that no matter where you go in the globe, because of the universality of Wi-Fi and the universality of everybody being able to connect to one another on Zoom, I think in the next few years, you will see that most people in most parts of the world will know at least one person at a fairly you know, useful level, like either at least at the level of, as an acquaintance, they will know at least one person that lives far away from them. And in that sense, we are becoming more globally connected as, a, as, a, as, as humanity. I'll stop there and let you go on to the next question. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you. And actually, uh, in the early uh, using of Zoom, uh, it's really, if, you, if you're not just a listener to the Zoom meeting, but you're hosting it or you're uh, performing on it, it takes really a lot of energy to go through the screen in order to get people uh, to behave with you. 
But now, actually, everybody is no more, more and more relaxed uh, with the Zoom conference, I would say. Uh, and that's um, the next uh, uh, adding what I would like to, to say on your speech. And thank you very much. Uh, I would like to ask uh, now Professor Zuthoff, and uh, he is really uh, already with us. Dear Thomas, uh, what solutions uh, do experts offer and how to avoid falling into the mental trap of a new era? Uh, and the next one is how does to maintain this balance between uh, hating it, anxiety and uh, indifferences? Uh, very uh, glad to hear you now. I would really like to thank the organizers for the wonderful introduction to our work and to us and to me in particular. It's an honor for me to be part of this group and to talk about my thoughts on how COVID-19 has affected people psychologically, neuroscientifically, in terms of their lives, in terms of their well-being. Let me start off by saying that I am not an expert on either COVID-19 and that I'm not a psychologist. I'm an academic scientist who works on the brain and my expertise is really in neuroscience. That's what we do. We try to understand the brain. I don't treat patients anymore and I'm not a psychiatrist either. My remarks are informed by my understanding of how the brain works and by how the brain may work in response to challenges such as COVID-19. And my remarks are also informed by my work with drug companies, including companies that develop vaccines and companies that are devoted to discovering treatments for brain disorders, in particular neuropsychiatric and neurodegenerative disorders. So I'm talking to you here, not as an expert on COVID-19 or as an expert on mental diseases. I'm talking to you here as a neuroscientist. And I'm not sure how helpful my comments will be, but I will try to give you this perspective as a compliment to the other perspectives that more knowledgeable people in this discussion will contribute. The biggest effect of COVID-19, besides the enormous medical suffering and excessive mortality it induced, which is a huge burden on millions of people. But in addition to that, the biggest effect is social isolation. The fact that people have to sequester from each other, that they have to be separated, that kids often can't go to school, that older people can see relatives has had a tremendously negative effect. And we know from neuroscience experiments that even in laboratory animals, social isolation leads to a reorganization of brain circuits and changes behavior. It can even cause a presentation that is similar to post-traumatic stress syndrome, suggesting that in human subjects as well, this is a very negative danger of the situation. <clears throat> Social isolation causes, in addition, potentially cognitive isolation. What happens is that people no longer know what to trust and what not to trust. People distrust each other. Fake news, so to speak, becomes real news. They distrust information outside of their bubble, of their social circle. And that social circle becomes narrower and narrower due to the social isolation. In the age of social media, on the other hand, people increasingly rely only on information that they receive in response to their own biases. This is what I refer to as a bubble, a cognitive bubble where the people are no longer confronted with independent opinions, but only with opinions of their bubbles. In this sense, social media is everything but social. It's not social because it actually isolates people from each other. 
from divergent ideas, from divergent cultures. It renders people less likely to have to deal with other opinions. And as a result, people honestly no longer know what is true or false. We, as scientists, as neuroscientists, have not always been helpful. We also have not always been honest about how much or how little we know, which has led to distrust in the public opinions. We have not been clear and transparent sometimes because we wanted to increase the excitement or we wanted to get more funding for reasons that are not honorable. And so we as scientists have to also blame ourselves in part for some of the problems that have occurred in the perception of science by the public. As you know, there's a tremendous resistance to vaccines in some parts of the population, amplified in social media bubbles where people only hear potential problems. As scientists, we need to be absolutely transparent about how much we know and how much we don't know, even though that is sometimes difficult to communicate. And I think that we as neuroscientists in particular should be more honest about the fact that despite a huge amount of progress, the understanding of how the brain works is in its infancy and we need to better communicate the limits of our understanding, which also implies that we need to communicate better the limits of our understanding of vaccines, what we know, but what we don't know. For example, vaccines are clearly beneficial and in my opinion, are validated to not cause major side effects in the vast majority of vaccinated people. But we still don't know, for example, how long the vaccines will be effective and whether new variants of coronavirus will actually be protected by the vaccines. Well, in other words, whether these new variants may overcome vaccines. We also do know that vaccines are never 100% protective, that vaccinated people can get the disease against which they are vaccinated, even though the disease often is more mild. And we need to aggressively communicate that vaccines are not fail proof, that there's people who will become sick with vaccines and that this is normal, this is expected, this is not surprising. In terms of how to deal with the neuropsychiatric consequences of social isolation induced by COVID-19, with the fear that people often rightly so experience of getting sick and becoming potentially debilitated. I am not qualified to give any advice because I'm not a psychiatrist. I'm only digitally, I'm only peripherally involved in digital medicines, but not in any social media at all. My perception is that it is difficult to reach people who have made up their mind on often nonsensical opinions. And that simply telling them that they're wrong is pointless. <clears throat> I act factually, actively, I actually have close relatives myself who believe that vaccination is evil and there's nothing I can say to change their mind. The only recommendation I can make is to introduce simple, transparent rules on all internet postings. Rules that are not under control of governments but are agreed upon internationally by everybody, from social media to scientific journals. Because in scientific journals, Surprisingly, we also have a problem here. So that everyone can see and understand what information comes from where and can make their own judgment. There must not be any hidden censorship that seems to operate in many countries where certain content simply vanishes, but there must be explicit rules because that's the only way how we can regain the trust, which is particularly important in the case of COVID-19 as it will happen now again and again, as the virus mutates. In my area of expertise, biomedical research, these rules would mean 
that scientific journals which publish scientific results have to render the entire process of publication transparent. They have to post correspondence and reviews they receive, not just select those they like. And they have to also declare the entire financial structure that operates in these journals, i.e. how much money they make on what, how much they pay to whom, and so on. I firmly believe that we as scientists need to be part of a larger effort in this pandemic, in this crisis, that's a truly a crisis, to regain the trust of all segments of the population in scientific results in order to decrease the consequences of this very uh, devastating pandemic <clears throat> and also beyond the pandemic to develop science further as something that populations worldwide can trust and can rely on in future developments. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Thomas. Uh, it's really an uh, interesting view uh, and uh, lots of uh, things about uh, after this forum. Well, uh, what I would like to say uh, at the end is actually we just uh, in the forum which brings uh, scientific fundamental uh, researchers to the fields of uh, innovative uh, or to the hands of innovative uh, entrepreneurs and making these uh, ideas uh, become the real business. And uh, these uh, trends, these ideas uh, should really consider all these effects and all these topics which we just discussed. And uh, there are lots of cons from the digital technologies which bring to our lives. Uh, but also, this is really difficult for the people to adapt to rapid changes uh, in their lives. And uh, many services will become or already became the integral part of our lives. Uh, and maybe for the next year and two, we will see much more digitalization of uh, all the things uh, which around us. And, uh, the new, I would say, becomes more faster than we think and we manage to integrate into our lives. As for medicine, it's already clear that the digital medicine, and I know because we're investing in the digital medicine companies and we're working on the telemedicine with the COVID, with etc., it will not totally uh, replace offline medicine uh, in many areas, but it can and that's actually what Thomas said about the chemistry and the, the, the reaction of the people uh, talking to themselves live, not only on the screen. But uh, it can reduce the digital, the telemedicine, can reduce the burden of the doctors uh, taking over the primary consultations, uh, determination of uh, your uh, health conditions through the, all the gadgets we wear now at the moment. I mean, watches, uh, heart monitors, etc., etc. And uh, actually, the time will be more crucial factor. As fast as you can receive the diagnosis and as fast as you can receive the proper health, it will be more uh, important to you and uh, in uh, normal life. Actually, uh, in, in this area, we just uh, had an uh, the study and the people suffering from uh, depression caused by lockdowns and caused by post-COVID uh, stations increased only during the 2020-2021 by 80%. And we actually see how the people call to the hotlines and to talk to the doctors just talk about uh, what to do, I'm feeling depressed, etc., etc. And uh, they actually this brings me to the, another most important thing to understand in these situations. To experience some anxiety, it's normal. But uh, to get into this, uh, I would say, by your ears, is actually what uh, brings attention, what we need to, uh, to be focused and uh, respond to our 
decisions, right or wrong. Uh, and actually, the, the important thing now is, uh, or being in that situation, being in the pandemic, is to learn how to manage your resources, your plans, your change of outlook of your life, uh, which brings us online and offline business, and uh, more practically, uh, actually adapt to the situation and receive the simple happiness of life. To find this happiness in the new era, in new post-pandemic uh, things. And from myself, I think that the sport and the, the physical uh, uh, exercises in such ways can teach us to use how to manage our lives. For instance, it's specifically proven that people uh, who do exercise daily or each week uh, feel much more happy in general than those who don't. I'm not advising you to start from this uh, session and go to, to the gym, no, but just to consider it. Just to consider uh, this, and I'm actually an example of that after I uh, started joining the Global Ironman program. It's uh, actually a very long uh, sport game when you swim, bike, and run. Uh, it started to affect my normal day of life and uh, also working balance. So it's more like a strategic thing because you need to find uh, strengths to do it in 226 kilometers. But it's also for work. Either you're sitting on daily Zoom conferences and uh, your daily schedule just filled with the Zoom, 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 and you need to feel strengths to do so. And uh, that's why uh, bringing this knowledge from your daily routine, from your sports life to your work-life balance is also really crucial in these, uh, in these times. And, um, well, finalizing all these uh, uh, discussions and uh, once again thanking our uh, colleagues uh, who was uh, discussing with me about all these uh, topics, I just want to say one thing because this forum is not only from theoretical thinking but also for uh, searching new ideas, new uh, services, uh, new technologies to help us go through this period. And we as an investors searching not only financial uh, aspects of the firms, of the companies and uh, incomes and IRRs nowadays, but one of the most important things, we're looking for social responsibility and social impact on those uh, areas where we invest. And uh, we strongly believe that uh, the successful business with this approach, we can solve the global mankind problems and, for example, digital services scale well. They scale well. We don't need some barriers or lockdowns or borders. And that means that we can have unique opportunity to accumulate all the knowledge, all the experiences we just received from this forum and uh, spread it around the world. And I hope this approach will be able to uh, continue and uh, help us to be normal, be happy in the new uh, years to come. Thank you very much, all the participants. Thank you very much, Sheena. Thank you very much, Thomas, for sharing your thoughts, your knowledge with us today. And uh, welcome to the Nobel Forum. Thank you very much. Goodbye.